Oh. Ava, I need you to sit down. Yeah. Oh. Good evening. May I have your attention, please? Oh, okay. thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to Nancy Fraser's uh, lecture uh, tonight on three faces of capitalist labor, uncovering the hidden ties among gender, race, and class. Now, not, were it not for the immense pleasure it gives me to welcome Professor Nancy Fraser tonight, I think introducing a speaker of your renowned Nancy is actually completely superfluous exercise. I think this is not a rhetorical compliment. I think most of the uh, students who are here and colleagues know your work well. But I think I'll fulfill my ceremonial role with a very brief uh, introduction. Nancy Fraser is the Lowe Professor of Philosophy and Politics at the New School for Social Research in New York. She's held several visiting, prestigious visiting positions uh, at the uh, Ecole des Etudes in Paris, the Humanities Visiting Professorship of Women's Rights at King's College, Cambridge, and delivered very many endowed lectures, including the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Stanford, the Spinoza Lectures in Amsterdam, and Nancy is no stranger to Vienna. She was here two years ago at the invitation of the International Karl Polanyi Society. She gave the inaugural Polanyi Memorial Lecture here in Vienna and uh, a set of advanced seminars, and she was the first Karl Polanyi visiting professor at, um, at well, I think, the Consortium of Vienna Institutions, uh, among them my older institution, the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Nancy's got uh, such a large number of prizes that if I were to read them all out to you, I'll take up her time. So let me just mention the most recent prize awarded to her is the Nonino uh, Prize, Master of Our Times in 2022. She's been a, a fellow at almost every Institute of Advanced Studies that you can think of, from Stellenbosch to Wissenschaftskolleg to the IWM here in Vienna. To say simply that Nancy Fraser works on social and political theory, feminist theory, contemporary French and German thought would be really actually an understatement. She's made groundbreaking and agenda setting theoretical contributions to all of these fields. From her first book, which some of you may know, Unruly Practices, Power Discourse in Gender and Contemporary Social Theory, it's 1989. I think probably before many of you were born. <laughs> It, you may want to take a look at it um, now, to her very well-known um, book, Culture, um, and uh, no, it's called Feminist Contentions, Philosophical Exchange. It's co-authored uh, with um, Judith Butler, Sela Bin Habib, and Drusilla Cornell. Fortunes of Feminism, from stage managed capitalism to neoliberal crises, 2013, and then Feminism for the 99% manifesto in 2019. She's been one of the foremost advocates who's extended feminist critical theory beyond the limits of mainstream liberal frameworks. This critique of the inherent limitations of liberal thought and identity politics in the more general sense also informs the debate that she sparked with a series of articles she published against what she terms progressive neoliberalism. The theoretical interventions on conceptualization of justice outlined in books such as Mapping the Radical Imagination, Scales of Justice, occasionally also an influential debate about distributive uh, justice and recognition, epitomized in her well-known exchange with Axel Honneth, that's the book Redistribution or Recognition. Her most recent work has been on capitalism. 
It, uh, I mean, let me just mention two uh, of the books. Um, they are in German as well as in English, Capitalism, A Conversation in Critical Theory. It's with Rael Yegi. And The Old is Dying, The New Cannot Be Born. This is in 2019. It's a Gramsci um, quote, as uh, you know. And then the most recent one, 2022, also available in German, called Cannibal Capitalism, how our system is devouring democracy, care and the planet, and what we can do about it. This brings together the strands of her earlier work into a really ambitious provocative synthesis, which reconstructs, but it also expands Marxist theory of capitalism and especially of labor on which a lot of her recent work is focused in a heterodox manner because it is very much about gender and race, two ideas which are concepts also under theorized in Marx's own writings. So this uh, forms the backdrop to her uh, talk today. I'd recommend to all of you who have not read Candle Capitalism yet to do it. If you want a shortcut, you can listen to my podcast. I've just done a recording of, uh, on her book uh, with her uh, just half an hour ago. It'll be the first of the series of podcasts in season eight in January. So I begin my new season with Nancy's podcast. What we'll hear today is a genuinely intersectional understanding of class, gender, and race embedded within a critical theory of capitalism, which is historically grounded. So it analyzes the interconnections between various different structures of domestication, expropriation, exploitation within the dynamic relational totality, which shapes and determines capitalism in fundamental ways. It, of course, entails a politics of recognition, so that is a strand which is still very much present, but in a different sense, as a reflexive act of recognizing the particularities of specific injustices that can only be overcome through multiple solidarities across these domains. Such a politics, as Nancy reminds us, cannot stop short of inventing and I quote her here, a new societal order that overcomes not only class domination, but also asymmetries of gender and sex, racial, ethnic, and imperial oppression, political domination across the board. So familiarizing ourselves with a defamiliarizing view of the three faces of labor is the first step towards such a collective act of emancipatory imagination from which an emancipatory politics can follow. With that, Nancy, a very warm welcome to you, and we look forward to the talk. My colleague, um, Judith Bodner, will be her discussant. She is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at CEU, and she'll take the Q&A as well. So for those of you who are taking notes or want to take notes on the questions you want to ask, start now. Well, I'm, I'm fairly short, so I think I'm going to not try to be seen over that and stand at this odd angle. Well, um, as you see from the title, and thank you very much, uh, Shalini, first, for, before I start, for this generous introduction, for inviting me here. Thanks to all of the people that had a hand in the organization, and I'm going to thank you in advance for her comments. Uh, okay, so the concept of labor is at the center of my lecture, and you might think that in proposing that focus that I plan to return to a familiar de passe model of critical theory, or you might think that I subscribe to a labor metaphysics that purports to identify the single quintessentially human feature that constitutes our species being, to use Marx's term. If so, you would be mistaken. My goal here is actually to develop a new post-metaphysical paradigm that is capable of clarifying the most pressing problems, both practical and theoretical, that we face in the 21st century. Certainly, I'll speak a lot about labor's place and character in capitalist society, but not in the orthodox sense. My aim is, on the contrary, to transform both of those concepts, labor and capitalism, 
and through them to rethink the famous triad, gender, race, and class. Over the course of the lecture, those last three terms will be transformed as well. Class especially will emerge in a new guise. Perhaps, uh, you know, just a second. Yeah, but again, perhaps you are wondering um, why labor? Why make that old fashioned concept the starting point for rethinking gender, race, and class? Isn't it tied to a perspective that prioritizes class over gender and race? Doesn't it risk reinstating that labor metaphysic and class reductionism that dominated social theory and political practice on the left in the past? Won't a focus on the hard won insights of feminists and anti racists be lost? Won't this focus take us back to the same discredited paradigm we have worked so hard to dislodge? My answer on all counts is no, for reasons I will soon explain. But I want first to tell you what is motivating me to pursue this project. For several years now, I've been struck by the extreme mismatch between emancipatory political engagement on the one hand and the present crisis on the other. Emancipatory engagement is plentiful and potentially powerful, to be sure. It encompasses feminism, anti-racism, anti-imperialism, as well as movements for labor and migrant rights, for social equality, livelihood security, for democracy and ecological sustainability, for peace, especially right now, and human rights. But those forces are fragmented and dispersed. Disparate and uncoordinated, they neither coalesce around a shared project nor constitute a counter hegemony. And so they are badly overmatched by the scale of the present crisis. It's a general crisis, I think, of our whole social order in which multiple injustices and irrationalities converge and exacerbate one another. I need only mention planetary heating and global pandemics, ballooning precarity and inequality, declining living standards and shrunken social provision, forced migration and blocked migration, racialized and sexual violence, authoritarianism and persecutory scapegoating, de-democratization and militarization, and now as, as if that weren't enough, hot war. Where is the emancipatory coalition that offers a credible response to this nexus of horribles? Where is the visionary breadth and practical heft that embodies a genuine alternative to the system that generates them? Where is the project that could go toe to toe against the powers that be, against corporate neoliberalism on the one hand and reactionary populism on the other? This diagnosis might sound grim, but I am not alone in subscribing to it. On the contrary, many social justice activists and thinkers have grown dissatisfied with single issue and group specific politics. Appreciating the need for greater coordination, they are now seeking larger frameworks that can connect the dispersed struggles of multiple movements, political organizations, and labor unions. The paradigm of intersectionality, which is hugely popular among feminists and anti-racists, and in fact has become a buzzword for all kinds of people today, is one important marker of this aspiration. Others include the reemergence of social reproduction feminism, racial capitalism theory, eco-Marxism, and in the US at least, democratic socialism. All these and more betoken a growing desire for integrative thinking and practice. My lecture is aimed at advancing that integrative project, albeit by a somewhat different route. I'll be combining social theorizing with historical and political reflection to offer an account of capitalist society as the common matrix 
that generates social divisions of gender, race, and class, as well as their intersections. I'll trace that generative process through the lens of labor, broadly conceived. Deviating from received understandings of labor, I'll argue that capitalist society relies on three types of work, not just exploited labor performed by doubly free workers in exchange for wages in for-profit enterprises, but also expropriated labor, unfree or semi-dependent, coercively extracted from racialized populations that have been subjected through conquest or debt. And finally, what I'll call domesticated labor, also known as care and social reproduction work, chronically undervalued, often invisible, and constitutively gendered. By mapping the entwinement in capitalist society of these three faces of labor, as I'm calling them, I aim to uncover the hidden ties between gender, race, and class, and with them, a possible path to more coordinated emancipatory struggle. Now I'm going to begin with W.E.B. Du Bois, who inspired this line of thought. His Black Reconstruction, which was published in 1935, offered a major new interpretation of 19th century American history and of global capitalism more broadly. An interpretation that centered on labor. The book, for those of you who don't know it, covers the period from 1860 to 1880, which includes the Civil War and formal abolition of slavery, post-war reconstruction, whose radical wing aimed to transform Southern society so as to make emancipation a reality, and finally, what Du Bois called the counter-revolution of property that reestablished Black subservience and white property rule. In Du Bois' view, this period was a major historical turning point in which fundamental questions about the country's future and by extension, the future of capitalism more broadly were up for grabs. Would the outcome be plutocracy or what he called an abolition democracy based on labor as opposed to property? Du Bois thought Reconstruction, that is the regime right in, in the South uh, after the Union victory, he thought that Reconstruction prefigured that second possibility, abolition democracy, by inventing a new use for state power to elevate and empower workers, both black and white. Its suppression was plainly catastrophic for the freed men and freed women, that is the former slaves, who were returned to a state close to bondage. But it also harmed poor and working class whites who lost the chance to improve their economic conditions and to amplify their political voice. Plutocracy triumph, at least for a while. Du Bois's narrative derives some of its pathos from this intimation of what might have been. Oops. But its analytic power comes from his conception of labor. In his view, the question of slavery was, it's obvious once you say it, a question of labor. And anti-slavery was at bottom a labor movement aimed at emancipating unfree workers, not simply by legal pro proclamation, but also by transforming the property system and power relations that governed their work. For Du Bois then, enslaved black labor belonged to the same conceptual political universe as free white labor and the radical wings of anti-slavery and reconstruction belonged in the same conceptual universe as trade unionism and socialism. In reality, Du Bois concluded the U.S. had two labor movements separated by color and status. Had they recognized one another and joined forces, they might have changed the course of U.S. history and that of global capitalism. 
Du Bois's account is revelatory, I think, because it broadens our view of what counts as labor and as a labor movement. So too does the image of two labor movements failing to recognize one another, or really we should say it's one failing to recognize the other. What was missed, Du Bois suggests, was the possibility of an inclusive pro-working class front. Appreciating that capitalist labor assumes more than one form, such a front would recognize and embrace more than one labor movement. Failing that, it would lack the political heft and breadth of vision needed to defeat plutocracy and expand democracy. Now, what is crucial for my purposes here is the idea of more than one, more than one kind of labor, more than one kind of labor movement. As I read him, Du Bois was not seeking to homogenize labor, to dissolve or pretend uh, not to exist, its internal differentiations, to treat labor as an abstract universal, the same everywhere. Rather, he understood free and enslaved labor as distinct but structurally imbricated aspects of a single social system. Enslaved black workers, Du Bois explained, were among the founding stones of a new industrial phase of capitalism, producing cotton for mills throughout the North Atlantic. They kept those enterprises humming, supplying raw material for their free counterparts to work up as commodities and for the latter's employers to convert into profits. Black labor also served as the fulcrum for an extensive commercial nexus linking planters, merchants, bankers, insurers, and mill owners who divided the spoils. Framing the whole process globally, Du Bois situated US Southern slaves within, and I'm quoting, a dark and vast sea of human labor in China and India, the South Seas and all Africa, in the West Indies and Central America, and in the United States, that great majority of mankind on whose bent and broken backs rest today the founding stones of modern industry. That word today, he's writing in 35 is important. We'll come back to it. Now this remarkable claim cries out to be read alongside Karl Marx's identification of the doubly free proletariat as the true creator of industrialism's marvels and as the system's eventual grave diggers. Where Marx gave pride of place to free but propertyless workers forcibly separated from the means of production and subsistence and compelled to sell their labor power in exchange for wages, Du Bois foregrounds the unfree workers whose labor power is not theirs to sell, but the property of others to command by the lash. In calling them founding stones of the world capitalist system, the author of Black Reconstruction delves beneath Marx's hidden abode of factory production to an even more hidden realm on which the factory rests. And it's the relation between those two realms, the factory and the plantation, that is all important. To call enslaved agricultural labor a founding stone of modern industry is to say that black expropriation undergirds white exploitation, that the two processes are inextricably imbricated, that the fates of the two groups of workers are tied together, that neither can be emancipated without the other, that two labor movements must join forces to abolish the system that generates their perverse symbiosis. This view, I think, remains pertinent today. As Du Bois noted, the abolition of slavery in the US and elsewhere did not put an end to unfree expropriated labor in the capitalist world system. To this day, bonded and dependent labor continues in various guises, and it is still strongly racially marked. Might not we then view the anti-racist and anti-imperialist struggles of our own time too as unrecognized labor struggles? 
But if so, why stop there? Why not view feminist movements too as unacknowledged struggles over work in systems built on a gendered separation of paid productive labor from unpaid and underpaid care work? Isn't that division between productive and reproductive work, so-called, just as integral to capitalist society as the one Du Bois identified between expropriated and exploited labor? And if struggles to abolish prisons and defund the police to resist ethnic cleansing and land grabs are at least in part labor struggles, as I believe they are, why not say the same about Me Too? whose chief objective, after all, is to rid the workplace of abuses of power in the form of sexual harassment and assault. And why not view campaigns for family leave, child care, elder care, health care, housing, and pensions as struggles to prioritize activities that nurture people over those designed to rack up profits? Why not view campaigns for reproductive justice, including abortion access, as struggles over the conditions of reproductive work and over the status of those who perform it. Finally, why not view campaigns for the rights of migrants and domestic workers and for the unionization of nurses, nurses, health aides, teachers, office cleaners, cooks, servers, and laundry workers as struggles to revalue social reproductive labor and to empower those who perform it. In that case, this work too would be a founding stone of the global capitalist system, supplying the owners with labor, both exploitable and expropriable. Extending Du Bois' argument then, I propose to view capitalist societies as relying on three analytically distinct but mutually imbricated forms of labor, exploited, expropriated, and domesticated. The relations among these, I claim, form the hidden ties among gender, race, and class in capitalist societies. So I'm endorsing Du Bois's political point while also expanding it. Our current aim should be to grasp the relations among not two, but three labor movements and to evaluate prospects for uniting them. I'm going to begin uh, this argument by considering the concept of labor in general. As I understand it here, that expression means effortful social action aimed at satisfying needs. But of course, it requires straight away an important caveat. Neither the needs that labor addresses nor the character of the labor that addresses them are given once and for all. Rather, both develop historically, as do the societies and habitats in which labor is situated, and as does the human nature of those who labor. Defined this way, labor encompasses efforts to provision human groups with food, shelter, and tools efforts that produce useful objects. But object producing labor presupposes other activities which maintain natural habitats and nurture people. Those efforts also count as labor. Every human society undertakes them in one way or another along with the making of objects. In fact, object making could not exist without work that sustains those who perform it. But the converse is also true. The work of nurturance could not proceed absent food, shelter, clothing, and the tools people use to fashion them. Thus, object making too is, in another sense, reproductive. Well, actually, in two senses. It assures continuation first of human lives and second of the societies in which those lives are formed and lived. Seen this way, our tendency to distinguish production qua object making labor from reproduction qua care work is problematic. By no means a universal distinction of natural kinds, it reflects historically specific arrangements that separate those activities from one another. In fact, 
historically, most societies have not assigned object making and people sustaining to separate spheres. Rather, they have intermingled them freely in shared social spaces, as when peasant women take their babies into the field and suckle them while tending their crops. In many societies too, all these labors are understood as useful and worthy. All belong to the same social universe, even when tasks are divided by age, sex, or class. Capitalist societies are different, however. What counts as work in capitalism is employment. And that covers a relatively narrow subset of effortful need-driven activities those performed for and directed by others in officially recognized workplaces in return for a salary or wage. Persons who are not employed are considered idle. Their efforts, often very laborious efforts to feed themselves and their families don't count as work, even when they nurture and replenish those who are employed. Moreover, Capitalism distends or attenuates the relation between effort and need. The efforts its laborers expend serve their needs at best indirectly as a means to the cash required to buy means of subsistence. What they produce serves their, their employer's needs indirectly too as means to profit. The question as to whether the commodities produced are otherwise useful cannot arise. The only question is whether enough people with cash are willing to buy them. In capitalism then, the decisive factor in the relation, uh, sorry, is the relation of effort, not to need, but to accumulation. That dynamic foregrounds activities that directly generate surplus value, I'm using Marxist terms, meaning paradigmatically, but not only waged work for private firms. Certainly that labor is no picnic. It is doubly free in Marx's sense, right? Not bound to a particular master, but also separated it from the means of production and, and therefore having to sell your labor time. Uh, those who perform it are paid only for their necessary labor time while the surplus value they create accrues to the capitalist. This labor in a sense then is inherently Sisyphean and the work is typically stultifying, repetitive and heteronymous. It's free only in the thinnest sense. No wonder then that officially recognized capitalist labor is a major site and stake of struggle in capitalist societies. Nevertheless, exploited labor is only the tip of the capitalist iceberg. Beneath it, lie two other genres of labor. First, what I am calling expropriated labor, which is close to what Du Bois called dark labor. And second, what I am calling domesticated labor, which is close to what feminists now call care work. Expropriated and domesticated labor are both forms of shadow labor. That's a term I owe to even Illich, who used it in another context. They are shadow labor, that is, intrinsic to capitalist society and entangled with exploited labor, but overshadowed by it, lost in the glare of the latter's presumed normativity. To say they lie beneath exploited labor is thus to say two things. First, they are founding stones in Du Bois's sense, necessary conditions for exploited labor, co-original with it, and therefore indispensable elements of the larger societal complex in which exploited labor is constituted as profitable and productive. But second, that their crucial role in that complex is systematically under-recognized and undervalued, if not wholly disavowed. And that's by virtue of capitalism's inherent economism, by which I mean is systemically driven and deeply reductive equation of work with activity that advances capital accumulation by expanding value. 
My point then is that expropriated and domesticated labor are just as intrinsic to capitalist society as exploited labor. Combined with each other and with the latter, they form three interlocking pillars of one social system. They are analytically distinct, but internally related and mutually imbricated. Each face of labor has its role to play in this society, but the role of each is co-constituted in and through its relation to the others, and none can play its role without the others. Together, they form a nexus that powers capitalism's signature productivity and destructivity, while also inscribing gender, race, and class within it both as deep-seated social differentiations and as sites and stakes of social struggle. Let me elaborate on each of them. Expropriated labor is unfree or dependent labor, unwaged or underwaged, coercively extracted from subjugated populations. In a sense, it's as old as the hills, we find it in one guise or another throughout human history, including in ancient empires and feudal societies, hence long before the advent of capitalism. That's doubtless why it has sometimes been considered residual, an archaic vestige of pre-capitalist society that is destined to fade away as capitalism matures. And yet it doesn't. We find dependent underwaged labor even now, in prisons, brothels, sweatshops, plantations, slaughterhouses, mines, and favelas, as well as in other industries that employ migrants, especially migrants without papers. The question is why? Why does this labor persist? My answer is that expropriated labor has a structural basis in capitalist society, although it's usually seen as the antithesis of exploited labor, it is better understood as one of the latter's enabling conditions. The reasons are both economic and political. Expropriated labor is cheap precisely because it's extracted from populations who've been forcibly deprived of state protections and actionable rights. Unable, therefore, to command a wage that covers their living costs, these workers supply a productive input for whose reproduction capital pays little or nothing. Firms benefit in several ways, by utilizing dependent labor directly in commodity production, by gaining access to cheap energy and raw materials produced by unfree labor elsewhere, by the availability of cheap means of subsistence produced in sweatshops and encomiendas, which lowers living costs and wages for all. By expropriating labor from unfree subjects then, capitalists can more, profitably, more profitably exploit free workers. It has been said that behind Manchester stood Mississippi. What was true in Du Bois's time remains true today. Behind Cupertino stands Kinshasa. Behind those who shop at Walmart stand those who sew in Dhaka. As Du Bois maintained moreover, the division between free and dependent labor corresponds to the global color line. And that holds today as well. Who else are the expropriated now, but that, re-quoting Du Bois, dark and vast sea of human labor on whose bent and broken backs rest modern industry. And we could add post-industry. This too is not accidental. By dividing free from unfree labor, the system also constitutes two distinct categories of persons, one suitable for mere exploitation, the other destined for brute expropriation. It thereby inscribes race as a structural fault line in capitalist society and planting within it a host of structural injustices, racial oppression, imperialism, settler colonial apartheid, indigenous disposition, and genocide. The common thread here is political exposure, the incapacity to set limits and invoke protections. Exposure is in fact, the deepest meaning of expropriability. 
the thing that sets it apart from exploitability. And it is expropriability, the condition of being defenseless and liable to violation that constitutes the core of racial oppression. What distinguishes free subjects of exploitation from dependent subjects of expropriation is the mark of race as a sign of violability. Once racialized, moreover, expropriated labor is constituted as servile and menial, degraded animal toil, inferior to work that is merely exploited. However bad the latter is, the former is and must be worse. Assigned to subject people and performed in subpar conditions, it is best understood as subwork. That's a phrase I'm going to be using. The expropriated subwork of racialized others, then, is a necessary background condition for the exploited labor, or the real work, supposedly, of capitalism's iconic workers. This is a Du Boisian account, expanding a bit. And I think it is right as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. To speak of a single two-tiered division within the systems producing classes misses a crucial point. Those two tiers depend on and are imbricated with a third, which I'm calling domesticated labor. Now that term is a little bit odd, and I want to tell you why I've chosen it. It signals the historic association of that labor with residential familial spaces set apart from factories and offices and formed as their complements. But this work is not performed exclusively within private households, holds, nor is it always unpaid. Rather, what I'm calling domesticated labor includes people nurturing and community sustaining work of many sorts, both unpaid and underpaid, and performed in a variety of different settings from private homes and neighborhoods, villages, to public agencies, civil society associations, and for-profit firms. Domesticated, in other words, does not mean domestic. To call this work domesticated is to say that it has been tamed, historically constituted as a form of shadow work, the devalorized reproductive other of productive real work. To see why, I want to try to distinguish the generic content of the activity from its historical form. The generic content includes birthing and socializing the young, caring for the old and infirm, maintaining households and building communities. In capitalist societies, however, that content is hijacked, reformed, or rather deformed, to serve another function to produce and replenish the populations whose labor power capital exploits and expropriates. The effect is to domesticate these activities, to form them as free gifts devoid of value. Stamped as non-work, they become the simple expression of maternal feeling or feminine instinct, merely natural, devoid of intelligence, creativity, and skill. As a result, domesticated labor, too, becomes cheap. Treated by capital like a natural resource, it is simply there for the taking by firms that needn't bother to replenish what they take or to repair what they damage. Here, too, capital uh, obtains an essential condition for its so-called self-expansion well below cost. Moreover, capitalism's signature separation of productive from reproductive labor implants gender division deep within it, much as its constitutive separation of exploited from expropriated labor implants race. The effect is to entrench gender binarism. And this binarism affects everyone, women and men, cis and trans, gay, straight, and queer. Well, even as it casts non-cis, non-straight, non-binary people as in anomalous beyond the pale. In addition, capitalism splinters domesticated labor internally. The system, as noted, 
needs more than one kind of labor power, not just exploitable, but also expropriable. Domesticated labor produces both types as well as itself, albeit in different ways. When it is devoted to replenishing exploitable citizen workers and the professional managerial strata, it is performed at least in part in households by relatives, friends, neighbors, and underpaid domestic workers, but also in social state institutions by professional or semi-professional public employees, and especially recently in for-profit firms by low-paid racialized subworkers. Things look different, however, when domesticated labor is devoted to sustaining expropriable others. In that case, it is performed in slave quarters and migrant work camps, in ghettos and on reservations, in internments and refugee camps, in favelas and open air prisons. Doubly disavowed, that labor is tucked away out of sight, the shadow of a shadow. Yet it too is socially necessary. Insofar as capitalism requires racialized subwork, it also requires gendered racialized sub care work. In its cheapness, domesticated labor has something in common with expropriated labor but the two types of shadow work differ. One form is stigmatized by a race, the other sentimentalized by a gender. Subwork is bestialized and degraded, toil unbefitting a human being, while care work is put on a pedestal, except of course, when it becomes subwork. Subwork is looked away from and kept at a distance, while care work is up close and personal. So the traits desired in each set of workers are not the same. Care workers should be creatures of feeling, exquisitely sensitive to others' needs, while subworkers should be thick-skinned, dumb beasts of burden who can take punches and endure pain. If the first are expected to be hyper-affective, the second must be affect-deprived. In general, then, the two groups of shadow workers are differently constructed, and those among them whom the system finds no use for, and there are plenty, do not belong to one and the same reserve army of labor. For some, however, the two forms of shadow work overlap, and for reasons that are non-accidental. Insofar as capitalist society, I just said this, requires degraded subwork, it also requires degraded care work to produce the latter. A nasty amalgam of care work and subwork, that work is constituted as sub care work. Here, then, in the capitalist organization of labor, we see a social basis for one type of intersectionality, which is much discussed by feminists. But there are also other types of intersectionality. For example, the historical trajectory of white male proletarians who started out as expropriated but organized successfully to expunge traces of their original expropriation and advanced in due course to pure exploitation, only to be dragged back into expropriation now through neoliberalization and expropriation by debt. There is also the intersectional trajectory of that stratum of racialized men who moved into the hybrid status that their lighter hued counterparts had vacated. These men were employed and are employed in factories, but in dirtier jobs at lower pay and are still subject to violation by police and racist mobs. In other words, they are exploited and expropriated simultaneously. These are just a few of the many labor-based intersections that animate capitalism's history. All of them arise, I claim, from combinations of the three faces of capitalist labor. The latter are the building blocks from which such amalgams and hybrids are fabricated. They constitute thus the hidden intersectional ties among gender, race, and class. The key point is that these categorizations are systemic, as are the faces of labor to which they are tied. 
race and gender divides have structural bases as in capitalist society, as does empire and of course class. Each member of the race class gender triad derives its social meaning and political force from its imbrication with the others. All three are constituted within one social system which forms the three faces of labor and deforms the three sets of workers. Conventional understandings of the working class are therefore misleading. Analytically speaking, race and gender are not alternatives to class, but structurally grounded divisions within it. And struggles against gender and racial oppression can plausibly be understood as, as yet perhaps unrecognized labor struggles. Much more needs to be said about the free, three faces of labor, their various intersections, and the forms of social struggle to which they give rise, including struggles over who counts as a worker. We need to account for both the functional integration and the political misrecognition that has historically divided three types of workers. We also need to determine for our own time whether and how far the labor lens proposed here can embrace and clarify struggles that may at first glance seem to elude it. Struggles against indigenous dispossession, police violence, settler colonial apartheid, and murder by debt. Struggles against abortion restrictions, gender binarism, and sexual assault, against planetary heating, imperial war, and forced and blocked migration. All of that is grist for future work and future discussions. Still, I hope I've said enough today to convince you that Du Bois was onto something important. Capitalist society relies on more than one face of labor and precipitates more than one type of labor movement. Du Bois's perspective has since been enriched and complicated by feminist analyses of gender care work and social reproduction. By combining their insights with those of Du Bois, I've suggested that capitalist societies give rise for non-accidental reasons to a system-specific nexus of not two, but three faces of labor. Again, analytically distinct, but functionally imbricated, internally related, and mutually co-constituted. The effect, I've claimed, is to uncover the hidden ties among gender, race, and class. It is also, I suggest, to deepen the conceptual force of the term intersectionality and to advance its political project. That project, as I view it here, is to build a counter hegemonic political block that embraces the concerns of three labor movements and fosters greater coordination among them. Nothing less will suffice, I think, to transform the social system that oppresses us all. At the start of this lecture, I posed the following questions. Why make the concept of labor the starting point for rethinking gender, race, and class? Doesn't it prioritize class over race and gender and risk reinstating labor metaphysics and class reductionism that dominated social theory and political practice in the past? Won't this approach lose the hard-won insights of feminists and anti-racists taking us back to the same discredited paradigm we've worked so hard to dislodge. I hope I've said enough here to convince you that the answer is no. Sometimes it's necessary to risk the appearance of going back in order to go forward. Certainly the proliferation of identity oriented movements and paradigms has delivered real insights, but it has also encouraged separatism and siloization of social struggle. The question we should ask now, I think, is whether we can resituate those insights in a broader perspective that integrates them with one another and with other equally necessary insights. How feminists and anti-racists reached a level of political maturity that allows us to relinquish the defensive postures we've grown used to in favor of the sort of offensive ones that our times demand. Are trade unionists reeling from the return of expropriation 
finally now able to see that the fates of exploited workers are tied to those of the expropriated and the domesticated. Can all of us grasp the severity and scale of the present crisis and rise to meet it by risking a broader engagement? Can we now make a reality of Du Bois's dream? Can we build an inclusive global pro-working class front that embraces the concerns of three labor movements and fosters their cooperation? I don't know the answer, obviously, but I hope it is yes. And I hope these reflections have contributed in some small way to clarifying what we must do to bring it about. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for this wonderful uh, talk. I try to be uh, brief. The, uh, what we do today is try to, I, uh, I will comment uh, on the talk very briefly, uh, and then uh, we have some time for, uh, for questions uh, as well. So I need to readjust. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, I was supposed to sit there, but it's easier for me to stand because I pulled my back this morning. So uh, it would be very difficult for me to actually domesticate that beautiful armchair uh, there. So um, let me start. It's a commonplace, uh, I think today in the age of neoliberalism, which crystallizes the logic of uh, capitalism, pure and simple, that capitalism is omnipresent. It increasingly permeates all spheres of uh, human activity. Not only does it seem uh, that there is no alternative, as uh, Mrs. Thatcher uh, said, but there is, no, there is no outside or transcendence either. Only the eternal present of history reified as second nature. Now, we have uh, all just heard a powerful and compelling argument as to why we can grasp the full extent of our current uh, predicament only by further extending our conventional understanding of capitalism and uh, doing this by looking at its constitutive element, uh, labor. Uh, Marx held that abstract labor, uh, that is the historically specific source of capitalist value, uh, was well on the way to uh, subsuming and thereby transforming all human work. Uh, work, as uh, um, Nancy Fraser uh, defined uh, in her lecture, is, um, I mean, it's an anthropological uh, definition, but, uh, but her definition was uh, an effortful social action aimed at meeting social needs. Nevertheless, as we have learned today, a far from insignificant part of labor has been systematically uh, externalized, uh, excluded from the wage nexus and, and uh, hidden behind the mystifying forms of commodity fetishism. Uh, in fact, however, accumulation vitally depends on the matrix of background uh, conditions uh, produced by ostensibly uh, unproductive labor, whether of the expropriated uh, or the uh, racialized uh, kind. Now, Nancy's uh, talk reminded me of, uh, of a certain um, saying um, from, the, uh, uh, from the 90s. We want to be exploited. This is what East Europeans used to say in the early days of the regime change uh, after 89, when scholars from the West warned about the depredations of capitalism, uh, East Europeans uh, seemed to uh, embrace all too enthusiastically. Now we dismiss uh, such uh, overzealous desire for self-exploitation uh, with a condescending smile at best. But after today's uh, talk, uh, we may attribute uh, more wisdom uh, to these early market enthusiasts uh, in one sense at least. As Nancy Fraser uh, convincingly argues, exploitation in the Marxian sense is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, which extends uh, way deeper than we thought. 
Yet the majority of our analytical uh, tools and many of the critical social sciences have privileged uh, the tip of this iceberg uh, for far too long at the expense of neglecting the other two phases of uh, labor or dealing with them merely in terms of identity or history outside the relational matrix of uh, capitalist social formations. By the same token, anti-capitalist political imaginaries of resistance uh, and social change have also uh, traditionally focused primarily, if not exclusively, uh, on the organized working class of industrial uh, capitalism. As Marx famously remarks in uh, Capital Volume 1, to be a productive worker is not a piece of luck, but a misfortune. Uh, but we can add then with Nancy Fraser that exclusion from the sphere of free uh, contractual wage labor uh, is hardly more fortunate, if at all. And without uh, charting the mutual implications of these three fundamental categories of class, gender, and race, we cannot even begin uh, to form an adequate understanding of our societies, let alone hope to transform them in a more uh, emancipatory alternative, into a more emancipatory uh, alternative. Um, in a historically sensitive and theoretically informed uh, understanding of capitalism, uh, to quote um, Nancy and, uh, and uh, uh, also Jason uh, Moore uh, on this, for every Amsterdam, uh, there is a Vistula Basin. For every uh, Manchester, uh, a Mississippi Delta. You added uh, other examples as well, but let me uh, also add uh, in the language of the uh, previous quotation, uh, for every breadwinner, there is also a homemaker. The ground, so uh, the ground baking speed of capital accumulation in Manchester's uh, textile mills relied upon the process of accumulation by coercive appropriation uh, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, uh, the cotton slavery nexus. The sweeping success of Dutch shipbuilding, long distance trade, and the splendid rates of accumulation uh, built on forests uh, of the Vistula Basin has also led to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, their environmental degradation. Uh, we can also add that uh, we are much more familiar with Amsterdam and Manchester than with the uh, Vistula uh, Basin or the uh, Mississippi Delta. Uh, let me just note here that the externalization of nature in capitalist production is another feature uh, of an extended uh, notion of the contemporary system uh, that Nancy Fraser uh, offers for critical analysis. One that she uh, she hasn't elaborated today, but, uh, but is central uh, to her critical diagnosis of the present uh, public crisis, uh, which I will come back uh, in a moment. Now, the capital labor nexus assumes exploitable, uh, um, doubly free, free laborers. But a lot of workers have not historically belonged uh, in this uh, category. Uh, the labor power of many has been expropriated by forces other than uh, economic ones, rather differently from free market uh, textbook scenarios. Furthermore, the work uh, of reproduction and care when non-commodified -com does not count as productive labor or work. Uh, nor a source of uh, economic value. Now, let me take uh, issue uh, here with the distinction between expropriated and uh, exploited and expropriated uh, labor. Uh, the primary uh, forms of uh, expropriated uh, or expropriable labor uh, are slavery, uh, dependent, uh, and bonded labor. But quite often, uh, Expropriated labor is also used interchangeably uh, with or as a synonym uh, for underwaged labor. For example, when uh, when uh, you talk about uh, sweatshops uh, uh, or prison work uh, and other similar examples, uh, very similar uh, in this way to the patterns of underpayment in the sphere of domesticated labor. Now, it seems to me that the distinction between, between exploitation and expropriation works best for the case of uh, slave labor. Uh, that is a historically and uh, geographically uh, specific case. Uh, and it's, re it's blatant in the juxtaposition uh, of the slave labor-based plantation economy of the uh, U.S. South and the wage labor-based industrial economy uh, of the uh, U.S. North. With the end of slavery, however, the emphasis seems to shift uh, slightly to uh, underwaged labor. Uh, sometimes suggesting uh, a mere quantitative difference from uh, wage labor. 
If it is simply underpaid labor, can we not subsume it under the general logic of uh, uh, uneven development? Um, uh, as David Harvey um, defines uneven development, the differential mobilities of various kinds of capital and labor uh, that follow from differences in the built environment and the social structures uh, that encase them. I mean, true uh, expropriated labor is often uh, racialized labor. But can we not see some of its instances as the weakest and cheapest uh, chains um, actively constituted in the general process of, uh, of the uneven development of global uh, capitalism? I mean, this is a provocation, but uh, it's not meant to sound as a class reductionist uh, argument. Uh, Actually, I mean two minds about this, uh, honestly. Uh, from the uh, normative perspective of uh, the politics of race and, uh, and uh, racialization uh, endemic to capitalism, I certainly find the distinction crucial. Uh, my analytical and historical mind, on the other hand, is somewhat reluctant to elide the differences between slavery uh, and various forms of uh, racializations persistent uh, um, today. So if you think about, uh, for example, the, uh, the early uh, um, racialization of the Irish uh, working class, uh, that's just one example that uh, comes to my mind. Um, secondly, uh, I could not support more wholeheartedly uh, your project for the extension of labor and the invitation to recognize anti-racism and feminism as labor movements. Uh, whose claims should be on equal footing uh, in, in a counter-hegemonic bloc that challenges uh, neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism that has produced some of the most uh, perverse and difficult to fight uh, alliances, such as the ones that uh, I think you mentioned uh, in your uh, book, which really um, uh, intrigued me, uh, when uh, Democrats join uh, populists and democratic socialists in the rehabilitation of uh, public power. So in, the, in, the, in view of your work uh, on the scales of justice, I assume that the counter-hegemonic politics you advocate in your um, latest books and works would naturally have to be scaled up to the, uh, to the transnational or at least uh, the uh, international level uh, to be viable at all. Uh, but you are also very much aware of how much more successful uh, uh, ethno-nationalist far-right forces have been in recent years uh, in uh, mobilizing those uh, left behind in the uh, race to the bottom of uh, neoliberal uh, globalization. And you clearly acknowledge that uh, we are in a rather paradoxical situation. The political economic foundations of racial uh, inequalities and hierarchies may have disappeared uh, at certain places, but the latter still persist and dominate many societies, both in the global north and the global south, as well as uh, between them. Uh, um, so uh, I would be curious um, to hear um, your explanation of, uh, or at least a few examples of how race and class solidarities can be articulated against the threat of populist um, ethnicism and, uh, and racism uh, itself. Uh, and um, thirdly, um, okay, uh, your talk did not address the uh, environment, uh, uh, the other of humanity, um, which is nature, uh, but you talk about this uh, in your book and it's crucial um, also in uh, um, when we talk about today's ecological uh, crisis. And that seems to be uh, one of the most uh, visible uh, parts of the, uh, the multiple crises that you describe uh, in, uh, uh, in your uh, book. And I would be curious to see how, uh, how it impacts uh, on the three phases of labor and how um, would ecopolitics uh, or ecosocialism be integrated in the uh, politics of labor as you, uh, as you explored uh, tonight? I know this is a long question, so this is a long-term thing, but before you would have a chance to answer uh, these questions and uh, many more uh, from the um, uh, audience, uh, let me just, uh, let me just um, thank you on, uh, emphasizing a certain aspect um, 
uh, of this whole dis uh, discussion here, recognizing the, uh, the hitherto unrecognized, which was the main thrust of your uh, lecture today, uh, and also your work, um, is not only a welcome political gesture for me, uh, I think it also makes for uh, better scholarship. So I would uh, just like to thank you for reminding us of this uh, today again. Thank you. So if uh, I have a proposition uh, here, if um, but let me ask uh, Nancy, uh, would you mind if we took some questions from the audience and then uh, you would deal with the questions together because I was uh, warned that we were running out of time. Uh, so, uh, so let me uh, open the floor up uh, to questions. Uh, and for that, I have to actually put on my glasses to see the audience uh, better. So I already see uh, a question uh, here. And then let me just, I'm sorry, I have to survey the grounds. There are two more there, and uh, so then makes it four so far. So let's take four. Uh, right now, so let me... uh, okay. Uh, so first, I want to thank you uh, so much for this talk. That was as amazing as everything you write. Uh, as you can see, I'm a huge fan of your work and of your politics, and you're a huge inspiration to me, so I want to start by saying that. And I have a question that I'm going to direct to you, but I don't want to be unfair. This question is also directed at everyone in this room. Uh, my question is about um, the trend of neoliberalization in um, universities and higher education. And to better elaborate, uh, I am a PhD student here at CEU, and my colleagues and I, um, who are PhD students, are at the receiving end of this trend of new liberal liberalization. So for example, we are not employed at CU, uh, contrary to what happens in other universities in Austria, uh, even though we produce crucial labor for the university. Um, also, we are forced to uh, register as self-employed in Austria, which gives us burdens, administrative and uh, financial burdens as well. And we are underpaid because uh, our stipends are below the at risk of poverty line in Austria. So uh, my question is, considering all this context and the context of crisis that we live, uh, and I know that context of the, uh, the concept of crisis is very uh, key to your work, uh, how do you interpret our situation in this context, uh, especially when the university keeps telling us that there is no other alternative? And what is your advice uh, for us to resist and bring forth our demands, uh, considering that we are in a private university uh, that lives within the... <laughs> As I proposed, I think we take uh, all the questions uh, together. So I'm sorry, we are really running out of time. And uh, let me just quote our previous rector, Michael Ignatiev. Maybe I'm not quoting him, just reminding everyone of his definition of what a question is. Uh, but the essence of that, it's, uh, it should be short. OK, so uh, the uh, three other questions, there were two uh, there, right? And then one uh, here. Okay. My question would be related, like, I don't know, like, the question of practice somehow. No, okay. The question would be related to practice. So, and also, like, practice is not like that separated with theory, but is it more like somehow constructive to deal with capitalism in this diffuse forms, unrecognized, and try to speak up about the, un, the new faces, new forms it creates? Or we should, like, and focus more on the most intensified form of capitalism, which is colonialism. So the case nowadays, nowadays in Palestine. So just the thing, like you mentioned, we want to be exploited. That this thing, okay, this somehow reflects the diffuse form. But the thing, when we show, like, or try to display capitalism in, in its most intensified form, like what's going on that, like the genocide in Palestine, somehow it will erase the illusion of this we want to be exploited. This is the extreme form of it. It's 
the high stage of capitalism is like imperialism in a sense, like this Leninist sense. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I don't. Uh, my intention not, is not to undermine the other questions at all because I think they are. My question is very theoretical, but I don't want to undermine other questions at all. Um, so, um, with the process, so with uh, this very um, uh, prominent processes of uh, immaterialization of labor and also feminization of labor and digitalization. Yeah. So, um, with, uh, with this prominent process of uh, feminization of labor, uh, digitalization of labor, and also uh, immaterialization of labor, uh, mm, my question is more, more uh, about the different kinds of subworks that are uh, becoming domesticated uh, nowadays. Uh, and I was uh, wondering how would how you would conceptualize uh, different forms of subworks that are right now uh, done uh, in the in the home as the as a new domain of uh, work. Uh, in my in, in the case that I'm studying, for instance, women are um, at the same time uh, involved in different form, forms of entrepreneurship and care uh, at home and. Uh, I just want to uh, ask this question that how does this can work with uh, your concept of uh, doubly free, uh, uh, like th this doubly free labor? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Last question. So after the back rows, we are coming back to, uh, to the front rows again. So thank you, that was really great. And I really loved the argument in your book about capitalism literally eating itself and eating its bases and your argument about inter-realm contradiction. And so I was just trying to figure out, it's really along similar lines as you did. Do these realms also map onto the forms of labor? And particularly, I mean, it's obvious in the case of reproduction and domesticated labor, but expropriated labor, when you said Mississippi is Congo today, I thought maybe they did. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, so we, uh, we give uh, the uh, speaker some time to respond right now, and we'll see how many more questions would be there if we had more time. So when Okay, so. Hello? No? Yeah. Uh, you, these are all extremely deep and, and hard questions. None of them are easy for me to answer, and that includes the ones that are raised by uh, Judith. Um, I think I'll start with Judith, uh, just going in the order. Um, my, in terms of the distinction between expropriation and exploitation, I understand this as a, a highly a sort of analytical distinction and then when you look at the real world, which is much more messy, this is where you see the hybrids, the amalgams, and so on and so forth. I think that to have the sharp analytic distinctions is uh, useful. I would even go so far as to say necessary for making sense of the messiness. Um, analytically, um, my distinction has both an economic and a political dimension. The political dimension or status dimension has to do with juridical status, right? Whether or not you are actually uh, able to dispose of your own labor power as something that is yours to sell, whether you are bound in any way to your employer. And it's not just a, a simple binary of, uh, right, uh, literally chattel slaves on the one hand, and you know, iconic unionized uh, citizen workers on the other. Um, 
there, there's a lot of very interesting literature, big debate, some of which uh, was carried out in the journal Historical Materialism. There's an Indian guy named Banaji, if I remember correctly, who wrote a yes. lot of, right, yes. right, a lot of very interesting stuff and was criticized by some other guys and so on. Um, you know, because some people are claiming, look, wage labor is hard to free. Um, isn't this a continuum? Aren't uh, so-called doubly free workers subject to, to violence uh, also uh, under many conditions? So I, I recognize these complications, but um, I still think uh, that the, I, I don't think you can just say, you know, slaves and, and factory workers are in, in the same boat. Uh, um, it's not pretty for either of them. One is is less pretty even, <laughs> and uh, and that they need different kinds of analysis. The second aspect is economic, and this has to do with the underpaid business. The economic aspect that, that I'm, I'm I'm following Marx's definition that uh, exploitation means that you are paid only for the hours in which you produce value that that covers your necessary uh, living cost. So to the, the capitalist is supposed to pay uh, for necessary labor and only appropriate surplus labor. One characteristic of racialized labor is that it doesn't, it's, it's underpaid in that technical sense. It does not even get the, the full uh, value of the necessary hours, let alone the surplus. And, you know, as I suggested, I mean, your ability to claim rights and protections and set limits has a lot to do with which category you fall into. So, you know, um, that, that's uh, how I, um, I, I understand it. Um, and of course, it, it, it's, not, it's not literally about color. You're absolutely right. Of course, that the yeah. Irish were racialized and there's a whole, you know, interesting uh, set of, of debates about a famous book called How the Irish Became White, for example, how much political struggle it took um, to, um, yeah, convince people that they, they had been put in the wrong category. <laughs> so th there's a lot of, that's part of the recognition struggle. It, it's, it's also people fighting to get into different categories that they've been shoved into. Um, I totally agree about the transnational scale and um, I, which is what makes the job on our side so daunting, because even though there have been successful revolutions in the past, which we can turn to to feel that that you know some people managed to do it, why can't we? Still, they have always actually turned out to be nationally limited, and that that is a daunting problem. Um, you know the the huge um, resurgence of ethno-nationalism in, in some cases almost close to fascism, in other cases maybe you could call it more populist. Um, I would say that um, th there's a lot going on here, but to me the most important thing in terms of a political response is to not start out by thinking that every one of these people who vote for, for Trump or Modi or, I don't know about Urban, that's a harder case, but okay. Uh, uh, not, that not every one of these people is a, uh, what Hillary Clinton family ca called a, a deplorable who's, who can never be reached. I mean, it, the, this reminds me of the 1930s, um, you know, in, in in Germany, where the same people voted for communists one day, the Nazis the next. There's a huge amount of volatility now, I think. And I, I have followed it closely in the United States where people who voted for Obama and then were supporting Sanders, then voted for Trump. I, I, you know, so these people are very disoriented. They are experiencing falling. We've talked about this in the podcast. The psychology of losing something that you had is quite different from the psychology of being on the bottom and trying to claw your way up. And it, uh, it, it drives people kind of crazy, actually. And they are you know, very insistent 
but I, I am not like those people. You can't pull me down to that to their level. Um, that's another recognition issue, right? Um, you know, of, of, of the, the not of the very nice kind. Um, to me, the most important thing politically is to validate the legitimate grievances of working class people whose lives are deteriorating and who are reacting badly, have erroneous diagnoses of where what their what the cause of their trouble is. They blame it on immigrants, on Muslims, on Mexicans, on Jews, on blacks, on whomever. Um, Validate the grievance and offer an alternative diagnosis. That's that's why. Don't moralize. That that was my critique of progressive neoliberalism. The, the sort of treating everything as a matter of bad behavior and bad thinking. There are real structural problems here, and if you sort of moralize everything, oh, you'll never you'll never win. win. The question, very quickly, I can see I'm already going very long. I haven't even gotten to questions from the floor, but I have to say something about the environment. Uh, what I've given you a portion of a uh, developing manuscript, and there's a, another lecture that is devoted to the question, does the approach I'm proposing constitute a form of labor reductionism that either you know, wrongly assimilate some problems as labor problems that really should not be thought about that way, or that just can't uh, clarify those problems. And I want to say, first of all, that I, um, I don't claim that this labor lens, as I've developed it, is a theory of everything. And if, it, if there are things that it really does not help us understand, fine, I'm not, uh, we have to understand those in some other terms and figure out some other way of linking uh, things. Um, I do think though, that it's, uh, it is possible to draw some connections um, and I, uh, between the labor lens that I've developed and the ecological problematic. Uh, and for me, it, it involves going back to Marx, to the idea that so masculine weren't very well, actually, Alf Deutsch is very mensch. Uh, anyway, uh, nature is man's inorganic uh, body. Um, meaning, uh, what we call labor is already uh, uh, represents a split between something that was more organic. Marx talks in the Grundrisse about this labor becoming merely subjective and in a sense naked by virtue of being split off from land, especially. Um, so, I, I, and, and labor doesn't happen um, without um, the so-called so metabolic interaction in some sense or another with nature, which is partially why capitalism is so destructive because it sort of denies, uh, does cannibalize and, and so on. So I would try to make some connections without claiming that, um, that, you know, I can do actually everything. I am not taking, since you quoted Jason Moore, I'm not going his route and saying nature works too, because I don't see nature as a candidate for a fourth labor movement. A labor movement has to, we need agents. And I know that the new materialism thinks that nature has agencies and so on and so forth, but not for the kind of political uh, project that I'm interested in. Okay, um, let me um, talk about, okay, the, uh, the, the neoliberalization of higher education. Boy, do I know what you're talking about. I teach at the New School, which is the world's most contradictory institution. It has a sort of leftish, it's sometimes overstated, but let's say a, a leftish um, uh, cast, uh, and it has a neoliberal political economy. Our, we have the worst funded graduate students in the United States, probably, and um, or at least of any university you've ever heard of. And, um, you know, a, 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 a of course, we don't have big science, so we don't get corporate funding. 
we don't have rich alumni, so we don't get that funding. Uh, we're not, we're private, so we don't get state funding. So where does it all come from out of the hides of the students' tuition? Uh, it's a, an abominable uh, system. And um, I, I don't have the, the magic uh, bullet, but unionize, that's what's going on in the United States. I don't know if you can do it here, uh, argue that it is work, that you are not self-employed, that you actually have bosses, and that you know by not paying you and recognizing you as workers and depriving you of all kinds of uh, uh, benefits, both at the workplace and through the state, uh, there is a unionization of graduate students and part-time instructors movement for that going on in the United States, which has won some successes. We're not famous for our powerful labor movement, so you might even be in a better position if you could get some allies in the official trade union movement. For some reason, the United Auto Workers, which just won uh, a pretty impressive victory, uh, got into the business of unionizing uh, university workers. So maybe there are unions here that could work with you. Anyway, I, I obviously don't know the situation. Um, the question from, from the back, actually, I think there were two. Uh, if I understood you right, uh, one was a question about prioritization. Are there um, some struggles that are you know, so existential and pressing that we should tell people to back burner other things and, and focus on that? And um, I can understand why it, uh, it feels that way, um, but my answer is no. Um, the part of what I'm trying to show here is that in this, that capitalism in its very structure, right, distributes people into different situations. For some people, the most existentially pressing question is whether the island they live under is going to be submerged in the ocean in a few years. For other people, it's whether their son is going to be killed by a policeman in a traffic stop. For, you know, who am I to say those are less important than something else? I don't think we need to get into that. I think that what we're, what, what we're trying to do here is say, whatever is most pressing for you if you understand it correctly, you will see that it's rooted in the same social system as the other thing that looks disconnected, but is most pressing for someone else. It's one social system. It differentiates. It, yes, develops unevenly, whatever language you, you want to use. And that means that the, that's why I think it's so pressing to have an integrated framework that actually shows people where they fit in this complex uh, animal that is capitalism. Um, is imperialism the highest stage of capitalism? Well, look, uh, it, the way I see uh, Palestine, Kurdistan, and so on, the, the, the tragedy of these things is that these are classic 19th century struggles for national self-determination that somehow have gotten, uh, somehow maybe we can understand how have gotten plopped down into the 21st century. Um, most of imperialism today does not resemble this. Most of it is through the IMF, through the uh, imposed austerity and the requirement of ever-growing astronomical uh, debt service, through um, foreign direct investment, through uh, corporate land grabs, so <laughs> uh, currency speculation, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I, I, that's how I would answer that. Um, God. I don't think I can, um, I take the, the point uh, uh, about um, homework uh, and, and, um, all, and, and I, I think it, part of what you were saying was what you know, feminists would call the double shift or it's maybe even a triple shift uh, nowadays. Um, uh, that's another kind of intersectionality, if you like, uh, people juggling um, many small little big work, you know, arrangements and, and dealing with kids and, and, uh, and so on and, and working in. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I uh, okay. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't have anything um, 
right now to say beyond that. And then that very, um, very precise theoretical question about the relation between hidden abodes and, um, and the three faces of labor. Um, I, th I, I haven't perhaps worked it out fully, but what I think I've done here in this new project is to sort of lift out the labor question and put it front and center, partly for political motives. I think it might have some legs as a, you know, a organizing framework. Um, but uh, I, nothing I've said, um, as far as I understand it, in any way runs counter to that, uh, uh, that framework, maybe we would now have to look, and I maybe I hinted at this, that, you know, that there is work that goes on in the home, in the factory, in the favela, in the, uh, in, in the state, state agencies. So, you know, we, and as well as, you know, um, agriculture and, and uh, extractive <laughs> mining and so on. So, you know, I think it would be worth thinking more about how, how to think, think about how where different kinds of work sit in that, that schema of it, the various hidden abodes. I'm sorry I was so long. Thank you so much. I, uh, we can wait. For... I'm sorry, we, uh, we promised that we would take that last question from here if it's brief. I think it was uh, um, in this region, right? Yes, there was one question there. So if you can, uh, there was one hand up when I, yes, 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 um, yes. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask because um, I've taken a seminar in climate politics where we analyze deeply all your concepts and we are thinking about the practical application of the counter hegemonic theory and how would you envision the movements realizing that they have the same issue like being anti-capitalistic, how would you see it becoming practice? Because we were thinking about it for a semester and yeah, <laughs> thank you. Is that still? Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, Shalini, your, your rector uh, mentioned uh, Gramsci at, at the outset. And um, this is a, a you know, a, a problem that has, you know, been central for, for in, in the left for a long time. It was, it was, you know, how to unite workers and peasants in, in the case of Lenin, North and South, uh, the most modern workers in factories in Torino with, you know, Sardinian the peasants living in a quasi feudal subjection. Um, and, and of course, Du Bois is raising that, uh, in another way. Uh, and so I don't think there's ever been a, a real revolutionary structural social change that was made by one right specific identifiable class or group or whatever. It's always about what, what Move and the Cloud call articulation. Um, I don't like the way they dissolve society into discourse, but I do like this idea of articulation as a political process of making connections. And I, you could say that that's what I was trying to do in Cannibal Capitalism by offering a map that showed how an ecological crisis, crisis of care, political crisis, crisis of uh, empire and so on, how how these things were, how you could understand that they all grew out of one dynamic within one social system, different different forms of one dynamic. And this is also the same impulse that is behind this current project uh, by trying to suggest that what I wanna show is, is two sides of this story, that, th that these forms of labor are divided the system, you don't even need at the outset conspiratorial thinking, right? 
bosses, you know, dividing people. That happens. But the system itself provides the fertile soil for these divisions. They're not just imaginary. They are grounded in, right, in the, in the social structure, as I understand it. So that's one side, divisions. And in, in draft uh, other chapters that I've done, I've tried to trace the history of uh, struggle and, and, and look at how feminist movements or anti-slavery movements got divided from trade union movements, who was seen as a worker and who not, what were the moments when forms of work that had been de-recognized before were recognized, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's a whole story about the, the political division, but what I focused on here was the functional integration. Maybe you don't like the word functional, I don't either, but the, in the system, they are, uh, you, you can't have exploited labor without the other two and vice versa. Uh, it's the way the pie is divided in this system. So I, it, the idea is to keep both aspects in mind and then to figure out how you can use a story about the integrated side of it to help unsettle the political divisions or, if, or even to promote more cooperation. Yeah, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, um, yes, okay, it's time uh, to, uh, to call it a day. Uh, so um, thank you profoundly uh, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture. And before, uh, before you go home uh, and uh, further think about the implications uh, of, uh, of Nancy's analysis, uh, let me invite you, I think we have a small reception in the back room. Uh, but before that, thank you again. Yeah.